Right after um, Odyssey's uh, presentation, we'll go ahead and, and uh, also take a, a bio break for about 15, uh, 15 minutes. Odyssey. All right, good morning. I am um, Ralph Ewig, CEO of Odyssey. Let me start a little bit by telling you about my own background. I, I started my career in aerospace with a PhD from the University of Washington. I've been in industry almost 20 years. Most recently, I worked at SpaceX, where I was a mission operations engineer for the first three flights of Dragon to the International Space Station. And then from there, I went to Aerojet Rocketdyne as vice president of engineering, managing about 300 people in eight different locations. With all that, I had technology under my belt and execution. And then the last piece I needed to start my own company was money. So I went back to Stanford to get a business degree. That's where I met my two co-founders. We started Odyssey in March 2015. And today I'm proud to say that Odyssey is a team of 10 of the most committed individuals you will ever meet. And they really do all of the work and I just have the privilege of talking about it. So with that, when people ask me what Odyssey does, I like to use the following analogy. Imagine you just purchased the phone. You take that shiny new phone out of the box and you find a note inside that says, due to network constraints, this device can only be used for one hour per day. Now replace the $600 smartphone with a $6 million satellite and you have the current state of the commercial space industry. Odyssey is going to fix this. Odyssey is a spacecraft data network that continuously links operators with their satellites in any orbit and at any time. This is especially relevant now because the industry is going through some very dramatic changes. Um, they're driven primarily by two factors. The first is the cost of access to space has come down. And there are over 15 new launch vehicles in development in the world right now. So that trend will likely continue. The second is electronics continue to shrink. So satellites continue to shrink as well. And you see people talk about deploying very large numbers of satellites to do some truly amazing missions. What it all adds up to is about $150 billion in annual revenue projected by 2020. However, the one thing that all these systems have in common that they absolutely cannot live without is the ability to link data back to the ground. And because most of them are going to non-traditional, fast-moving orbits, that has some very unique challenges. The problem is line of sight. So in this animation, you have two dots. The first one, blue dot, is a satellite moving around the Earth once about every 90 minutes. The second, the red dot, is a ground station. They can only communicate when they can see each other. They have line of sight. That window, coming over the horizon now, there's a link, is as short as 15 minutes or shorter. The upshot of that is, as a satellite, 85% of the time, you're flying blind. Now, you can improve on that by adding more ground stations, the obvious solution, but two-thirds of the Earth is covered in water, so you can only get to about 40, 45% coverage, no matter how many of those ground stations you add. And even beyond that, each new ground station is less optimally placed. So you get less bang for the money that you spend on building them. Here's a couple of cases where this matters. Satellite imagery is a very valuable commodity. But if the current constraints, commercial operators throw away up to 90% of the data they collect. 90% of their data never makes it to the ground. They have to select sight unseen which of the data they've collected is the most valuable. That's what they don't like. 10% is the equivalent of that little white box in this image. What these operators need is a solution that is always on, so they can maximize the revenue from the satellites they put up into orbit. Space weather data, also heavily utilized. In this application, the data is more valuable the more timely it is. So again, with the current constraints, up to three hours old. So what these operators need is a solution that allows them to take images as real time as taking a picture on your phone. Last but not least, large constellations of small satellites. Great promise for many applications, including aircraft tracking, also providing internet for people anywhere on the globe. The challenge with that is when you have hundreds of satellites, you also require hundreds of ground stations to control and monitor them. That is very expensive. So what these guys need is a solution that allows them to have multi-user support controlling hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites all at the same time. This 
is what we do. Odyssey is an always-on, real-time, multi-user, spacecraft data network. To put it more shortly, we provide a dial tone and space. The way we do this is with a really constellation of three satellites placed into a highly designed medium Earth orbit, combined initially with just two ground stations, San Francisco and Singapore. Eventually, when the whole system is online, we can provide 100% coverage anywhere from the launch pad to the distance of the moon. Here's how we do it. We broke the company into, uh, I mean the company roadmap, not the company itself, into uh, a roadmap with uh, five phases. Each phase is about a year long and has some very specific goals attached to it. In the first phase, we validated product market fit by talking to potential customers and we made sure the business model holds together. In the second phase, we focused on reducing key risks, technical risk, designing the architecture, execution risk, building the right team, and last but not least, regulation. We require a license to do what we do and obtain a spectrum that we need to get the job done. In the third phase, we're building our first um, ground station in San Francisco. We're also flying our first demo mission, Odyssey Zero. It's a small CubeSat mission. And we started selling capacity on our network, pre-selling capacity to uh, potential customers. Phase four, second demo mission. This one is going to the International Space Station, placing a terminal on the ISS so other users can use our service to download data. We're building our second teleport. This is in Singapore. And we are starting to build our relay satellites. It takes about two years to put these together. Finally, by the end of 2019, we launch and the whole system goes online. So let me tell what we have accomplished so far. You can't talk about space without talking about spectrum. Everything in space communication starts and stops with spectrum. Spectrum is tightly regulated at the national level by the FCC, at the international level by the ITU. And the good news is space use spectrum is not auctioned off, like it is the case for terrestrial use spectrum. But the bad news is for a new company like ourselves, we have to prove that we don't interfere with anybody else who's already there. And again, that comes down to a problem of line of sight. Until about 10 years ago, this is what space looked like. On the top, you have a picture looking at it from orbit. On the bottom is the view looking at it from the ground into the sky. Geostationary dominated everything. The majority of spectrum used was in geostationary orbit. These satellites don't move, as seen from the ground. Fairly easy to coordinate. Everybody gets a slot, they get a frequency, and everybody can live with each other. This is where space is going to now. This is a single satellite in a fast-moving lower orbit. In just one day, you can see it crisscrosses most of the sky it's much more challenging to coordinate. This is where the future is going. Just one of the mega constellations now being considered, of large constellations of small satellites, in a single hour will paint the entire sky in radio emissions. Very, very challenging to coordinate. So when we approach regulators at the FCC and said, look, we could consolidate a vast majority of all of that radio traffic into currently unused inner satellite frequencies bundle it into just three points and bring it to the ground in very specific locations. They were very supportive. So we filed our application at the international level with the ITU early on 2016. We followed up at the national level with the FCC at the end of that year. We just finished a public commenting period for that, and we're now the soon-to-be-announced proud owner of a little more than three gigahertz of spectrum in the inner satellite bands, which was critically important for us to run our business. Customer traction. One thing we learned early on is that people have to build Odyssey into their satellite before they launch. In the vast majority of cases, it's not retrofitable to existing satellites. There's some exceptions to that are very sophisticated DoD satellites, but in most cases, that's not true. So we knew we had to engage our customers early. We released our pricing about the middle of this year and started in earnest to take our customers through an onboarding process that goes from initial contact to binding contract. Today, we've engaged about 85 companies, and if they work through that um, process, at the conversions that we have seen to date, that equates to about 62% of our network capacity subscribed in year one of service. To put that in perspective, Odyssey in total at full capacity will generate about $200 million in revenue in a single year, and we only need about 25% to break even. So we're actually already in very good shape. Now, beyond commercial customers, very relevant to today's audience, there's also the possibility of government customers. 
Odyssey is my fourth space startup, actually. Um, two of them are still doing great, one of them went under. And one thing I've learned in that experience is that banking on your government as the first anchor customer may not be the best place to succeed. <laughs> However, that said, it's really, really important not to ignore government agencies either. Um, you just have to be smart about how you engage with them. It is important. So the first thing I want to do is make sure we don't compete. NASA has an existing asset called Tedris, which does something very similar to what Odyssey does. And that's really where the idea came from, because I used Tedris extensively at SpaceX, um, flying Dragon to Space Station. So we engaged the NASA scan office, and Jim Shear and his team have been exceptionally helpful to make sure that our plans finally integrate with NASA's plans and work both today and going into the future so users can interoperate between our network and the NASA network and you can roam between them just like you could roam your cell phone from here to Singapore to New York to wherever you're going. The second one is credibility. Um, NASA iTech has been hugely beneficial to us. Just being selected into the top 10 gave a huge boost of confidence to both our investors but also our customers. So thank you very much for inviting us. We really appreciate the, uh, the benefits we received from that. And then contracting. So now let's talk about taking money from the government. Um, as a small company, we don't want to directly contract with the government. There's all kinds of overhead associated with that that's really poisonous to a startup. However, there are many large industry players that do this all the time. And they're very interested in teaming with small innovative companies such as Odyssey. So what we've done is we've partnered, we have a teaming agreement with a $4 billion prime in the industry to bid on the NASA Sense opportunity. Uh, if this contract is awarded, there's a small business set aside. We will use that money to, again, work on the interoperability between NASA's Near Earth Network, NASA Tedris, and Odyssey to make sure users can roam between all three transparently, and it works seamlessly for everyone. Last but not least, this is my favorite, really, um, supporting commercial users of government assets. Our second demo mission called Odyssey Link. It's going to the International Space Station, placing a terminal on there. We're doing this in partnership with CASES, and the idea is really CASES manages commercial use of space station. So if you're a biotech or a pharmaceutical company and you want to place an experiment on space station, CASES will set that up for you. These companies are not space companies. They don't understand space communications and they don't want to understand space communications. They just want to set up a little ant farm, plug in their webcam and monitor the experiment on the ground. That's what we provide. So by putting a terminal on the space station, you get exactly that service. It's very similar to a Wi-Fi access point. You can go to any internet compute, enabled computer on the ground and do your experiment. So the government has been actually very beneficial and very helpful to us as long as you're clever about how you do it. Everybody in this room knows space, even new space, is capital intensive. Odyssey is no exception. We require about $100 million to build the system and get it off the ground. Most of you, if you're investors in this room, also know that investing in startups is very risky. 70% of startups fail, 90% of them fail in the first year. So if you are going to take a bet with those kinds of odds, make sure that the outcome, the potential benefit is equally impressive. Odyssey can absolutely deliver on that promise. We are looking at revenue next year from ground-based services. We'll be close or have the potential to reach a quarter billion dollars in revenue our first year of service, and we have a solid growth path to get to $2 billion in revenue as the market evolves. We raised our first round, it is a seed round in 2015, it was a $2 million round, we're now raising a series A, it's 80% subscribed, we have 20% left for interested investors, and if you have a particular strength in this field or investment thesis, I'd be very interested in talking with you after this event. In closing, I really want to just say one thing. Given the current state of the industry, the growth we're seeing in non-geostationary orbit, there's no question somebody is going to solve this problem of non-geostationary communications. Given the right strategic and financial partners, there's absolutely no question it's going to be us who gets there first. Thank you. Can you discuss which bands you're going to be operating on? Absolutely, yeah. From the customer side, everything is KA band. 
Internally, we use a variety of different bands, but everything is above 25 gigahertz. And uh, we chose this intentionally because the KE band inner satellite links were fairly underused at the time it be applied, and allows you to, um, to shrink components. Our antennas are very small, they're the size of a thumbnail, and uh, you need a little bit more power, but you have the potential of putting through some very serious data rates. Can you also discuss in more detail the breakout of, of your revenue projection? You had a pretty big claim there. It's like the second to the last chart. It was like yeah, absolutely. Everything. I mean, essentially, the market in total top down is about 150 billion in revenue being generated right now in commercial space. And we talk to our customers, what they tell us, they spend somewhere between five to ten percent of that on communication solutions today. So that's top down our market size, roughly about ten billion dollars total addressable market. Pricing, if you look at various options which are out there, we can talk about competition a little bit too. Um, ground station pricing on the order of $10 per gigabit. Uh, Teeters is commercially available, $116 per minute. We released our pricing intentionally to, of course, be better than that. So looking at our pricing, we have a, a pricing sliding scale, a discount for volume, number of spacecraft, et cetera, et cetera. But it's essentially around $4 per gigabit or $75 per day if you're looking for a TTNC solution. Um, with those numbers, looking at the capacity of the network, in total, it's about 400 megabits per second of throughput. If you just do the math, and you come up with about $200 billion in revenue in a given year. So final question, are you considering both a pre-planned and on-demand service? So the way we operate the network, this is something we, we learned from the cell phone industry. It's very much like a prepaid phone service. Um, essentially, you purchase capacity in a block ahead of time. Say, I would like to purchase two terabits of throughput, and I will start using it at some point, let's say January 2019. Um, you purchase it, you put down a 10% deposit. From that point forward, the customer only actually pays for what they use. We build in monthly increments. And then we prioritize traffic based on how early you purchased it. So that way we incentivize early customers. So if you came to us today and you want capacity at the same time as somebody who came to us three years later, the person who purchased first will be the person who is serviced first. We don't schedule calls quote unquote, ahead of time. So it's really just on demand. Whenever you want to use it, it's there for you. Eighty-five companies that we have spoken with and started onboarding through our process. Um, they're not yet binding commitments, but we've started the conversation with that many. And then some of them we have um, binding commitments. Others are more at a technical level where we're talking about integration of the system into theirs. There's a sliding scale because our customers range from something as small as a CubeSat startup to something as large as an established Earth observation company, with a public company with multiple billions in revenue. So it's really a, a very different experience. Um, we had a sales engagement with a startup at a conference, which is a person that came up to me and said, we're planning on doing this. I said, that sounds great. What do you need? It's like, well, I need this much to put this much data. I pointed them at the pricing calculator on our website, and he said, that looks great. Sign me up. That was the fastest sales call ever. Um, there's other companies we deal with where this takes weeks, months, a much longer time frame because they're looking at mission lifetime, so five to six or ten years, so it's a much harder commitment to, uh, to get that. Is there anything from your, any of the other companies that you worked in from your previous experience, like SpaceX or previous, that you brought on board to work on this? Can you elaborate on that? Or did, when, you, when you went after Odyssey, it was very specific. This was what I wanted to do. How, how did you come? How did you come to this route? <laughs> um, well, it's hard to have a space conversation without mentioning Elon Musk. So I'll, I'll mention Elon from my experience at SpaceX. One thing I've learned from him, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, he is flying to Mars and he is building his Mars rocket in a way, in a manner that allows him to get paid for every test flight that he undertakes. And he's delivering a commercial satellite in the process and gets paid for a test flight. So I thought that was really brilliant. What I wanted to do was contribute the next piece of space architecture um, in, in the way that we uh, built Odyssey. And I thought, what could I do that allows us to get paid for doing so? And then space communications was really the part that we, that we anchored on. So the idea is we are building a space communications network. And that is our business model. And it's, it's a quite high potential business model. But it goes beyond that. In doing so, we build expertise, which actually allows us to become very efficient at the next step, which could be in space transportation. So we're starting as AT&T of space, moving into the FedEx of space. Um, and that is the long-term goal.
Thank you.